Chris McRae a few weeks ago spoke about arrows. I picked up on it the week after. And this conference is about the greatest archer who is always accurate sending us out, sending what our faith out, sending what we partner with and cooperate with him on as arrows that go out into the wilderness to make a way, a path, a journey, a course of life. We spoke about that every idle word that we, that we say we are going to give an account for, and that's sobering. I know I can be an idiot at times and joke and whatever. I'm like, Oof, okay. Don't not be you, but just be really, really mindful about what's coming out here. We spoke about spirit and life being in the power of the tongue, blessing, cursing, that through our own confession comes salvation, doesn't it? If you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. There's something significant on our words in this next season. And as we, as we look at this, this thought process, this imagery of him being an archer, and we are arrows, we are loading arrows up, if you like, of faith or of declaration. We are an arrow ourselves going into humanity, He is the archer. I, I'm wired in a way that likes to get stuff done. If there's something to be done, if there's a, something to, to happen or what have you, we can get it done. If there's, if there's a strategy to operationalize and put a plan around, I'm in my happy place. And that's, that's just something that God's graced me with. But I have to, and I am learning to, allow Him to be the archer. And I just have to allow him to shoot me wherever and whenever he pleases. We ought to be sharp. The, the head of the arrow needs to be sharp. It needs to bring life. It doesn't need to be laced with poison on the tip. We've all seen movies where there's been a blow dart go and it's been laced with something and then conveniently 10 seconds later they drop to the ground I, I want to I, I, I want to share some prophetic encouragement with you continuing on that theme that the Lord is saying to us the battle is mine it's time to change the narrative the battle is his and picking up on that theme of our words and what we're declaring what we're believing for we need to change the narrative you know, I shared at the conference, there's this, I felt it, where it's like we're so used to, do you remember that, remember that, um, that game on like Windows 98 and you'd have that slide, that paddle that would go across the bottom of the screen and there was a ball that would, that would bounce off it and it would hit the, the corners and, and come back down. Anyone remember that? This is this picture that I had as, as, as I was preparing and it was this sense of we have been so used to the, the walls and the confinement and the restriction of our prayers, of our declaration, almost of our season, that we're just so used to the ball pinging. We're just so used to our prayers feeling like they ping around and they're not actually achieving and delivering and going to the point of destination that they, that they need to. Those days are not here anymore. There's just been this, this unveiling, almost like where the walls have just begun to come down. And it's like, whoa, hang on a minute. That which we used to be comfortable with or that which we got used to not being answered or that way of life or that things, the things we used to watch, the words that we used to speak that really didn't have any effect are now starting to go out. And they're now starting to impact. And they're now start, we're going to start to see answers to prayers that we've been believing for for so long. And God's just saying, the battle is His. We have to change the narrative. That's a literal word thing. That's a literal faith thing, an expectancy thing. It's like, let's not get weary in doing, doing good things. Let's sharpen up. Let's get excited again. Let's dream with Him again. Let's be expectant again. Let's believe that, okay, if anything is possible, 
and the world needs us right now, what is God going to do in and through us? Ordinary you, daisy pantsuit you, in, in, the coffee, in the coffee shops, in the highways and in the byways, and there, there is no restriction or limitation anymore. What are you going to do with it? I was speaking to me this morning. It's like, what are you doing with your freedom? What are you doing with there being no restriction and limits anymore? What are you doing? The battle is his. Change the narrative. He answers prayer. He is healer. The geography that you are in is for a reason. The street you live on, the family that you live with, the good, the bad, the ugly, you're there for a reason. You're his arrow, he is the archer, and he's going to fling you wide into places you never thought possible. Amen? Are you excited? I'm excited for you. Let me share with you some prophetic encouragement. Don't overcomplicate the journey. Insert your name here. Look behind you and see all the hurdles that I have brought you through and see the defeated army of Satan lying on the battlefield, defeated at your feet. Those walls are done and dealt with. That seasonal restriction, that seasonal boundary is done. It's pretty liberating, isn't it? Why are we trying to shortcut when, we, when I have carried you and have been with you every step of the way? It is in the journey that I have molded you and forged you with strength in the fire, ready to withstand the next attack. You are an overcomer. I have assured your victory. You need only stand. Therefore, do not try and go too far ahead or turn back and give up. Look up. Where does your help come from? Look up and see heaven's armies marching beside you and for you, for the battle belongs to me, says the Lord. My beloved one, I know there are moments in your life that have been marked by trauma and grief, fear and loneliness, pain and loss. The question today is, will you partner with me in changing the narrative you keep of these moments? You have the choice to choose how you reflect upon these moments. As Father, I do not dismiss or belittle the courage it takes to flip these memories around and look at them differently. I will do it with you. It is your choice how you remember these times and the impact they had upon you. I want to show you today where I was in the midst of your hardest moments. When you can recognize where I was in these moments, seeing how I upheld you and fought for you, then you can begin to change the narrative. From that shift, you can begin to speak of the victories you have found in me, of the freedom you now walk in, of my everlasting faithfulness. When you can see with clarity where I was in the midst of it all, then the pieces of your testimony can fall into place, becoming a narrative of wisdom, power, glory, and love. Amen? That's the word of the Lord for us this season. The battle is His. It's time to change the narrative. Over the next few weeks, I want to um, do a bit of an exposition over the Second Chronicles in particular. And we're going to look at a little bit of the Jewish history there and, and uh, generally what happened. But... In, in, it originally was one complete work, and then they split it into first and, and second. And the Jews at this time had returned from their 70 years of captivity to a land that was markedly different from the one once ruled by King David and King Solomon. There was no Hebrew, no Hebrew king when they returned, but rather a Persian governor, there was no security for Jerusalem, so Nehemiah had to rebuild the wall. This is the kind of era that we're talking about. There was no temple, so Zerubbabel had to reconstruct a pitiful semblance of the, the, the splendor and glory of Solomon's temple in those days. 
The Jews no longer dominated the region, but were rather on the defensive. They enjoyed few divine blessings beyond the fact of their return. They possessed little of the kingdom's former wealth, and God's divine presence no longer resided in Jerusalem, having departed from them. They were a people that were, that were out in captivity. They left this beautiful abundance and oasis, to use that language, and they'd come back, and it was completely different. How often in our lives do we, do we leave something? Do we go to a new season? Do we do something different? And then we turn back, and it's completely different. But I want to encourage you, God is still faithful, He's still on the throne, and He's got a plan and a purpose. Amen? We're just going to start and dig into maybe one or two verses of Second Chronicles chapter 20, if you want to turn there uh, for the next few minutes, and then we'll continue over the preceding weeks. What I want you to remember is the battle is the Lord's, and we need to change the narrative. The power of our words in this, in this time is so incredible. The restrictions gone, the walls are down, the opportunities are endless. Dream with the Lord again and just watch what He does. Second Chronicles chapter 20, we're just going to do two verses today and then we'll continue in, in the following weeks. It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came to, and, and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is En Gedi. Let's just have a look through what we've just read in that, in that one verse. There was a great multitude. There was an onslaught coming and a significant threat against Jehoshaphat. And his last experience on the field of battle was a narrow escape from death, for those that, that know his story. And so there was a, a bit of a PTSD type of response, I would imagine, from him. It's almost like you've just defeated one thing and now there's word that on the horizon there is a great multitude coming now a multitude of people sounds like a pretty big number what is a great multitude and you can just imagine what was going on in his mind let's continue reading and Jehoshaphat feared based on that news he feared and set himself to seek the Lord what a response. And proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help for, from the Lord. And all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. What a leader he must have been for there to be that response from Judah. There was certainly a sense in which Jehoshaphat feared the great multitude coming against him, but yet we see that he feared the Lord and was seemingly more awed at the power and majesty of God than the destructive force or the potential destructive force of his enemies. He feared because he was human. He had human frailty. He probably feared partly from his own guilt and the remembrance of what he had done wrong and the wrath that God had denounced against him. Yet he set himself to seek the Lord. He set the example by his own personal devotion. His attitude summed up by the word seek, it, that word actually occurs twice in Hebrew. 
It's variously translated, but the key word in this passage of Scripture was a basic sense of worship. That word to seek the Lord was to worship the Lord. It also means to discover God's will. It shows that Jehoshaphat's strategy was that he had a higher trust in God than in his military resources. And this morning, I want to encourage you to have a greater trust in God than your abilities, your strengths, the grace, the anointing, the gifting that's on your life. He proclaimed a fast throughout all of, Ju- all of Judah. And he did that so that they could express their humility and total dependence on God through a public fast. Could you imagine if, this, if the Redland City... If Karen Williams called a fast over this city of the Redlands, could you just imagine? What would it sound like? What would it look like? It's a pretty big deal. We're all stuck. I don't even think if I called one, you'd all, you'd all, you'd all do it willingly here. Actually, no, 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 no. Forgive me. You did it at the beginning of the year. Forgive me. But there were, it's significant. It was regions. It was people. It was, just think of, we have such diversity in this room. Just think, multiply that by thousands and thousands and thousands. Nevertheless, they came together for a public fast, abstaining from all food for a period of time and drinking only water. They gathered together to ask help from the Lord. The Spirit of God was working among them, prompting them to respond to the call issued from their king, Jehoshaphat. It was necessary to seek the Lord because they needed extraordinary help. They needed to seek the Lord in an extraordinary way. And we're going to unpack what happens later on in the coming weeks. This morning, I I really want to pray for you that God would begin the marinating process of understanding that the assignment ahead, now I'm not suggesting there's a huge army coming your way, but what I'm suggesting is what is ahead of us is so great that our collective response, just like it was in this, this few verses, is to seek the face of God, to worship Him, to pray, to find out His will, to fast, to at all costs do whatever it takes to reverently fear the Almighty God. My prayer for you this morning is that you would begin to see what the Lord is doing and calling you into for the season ahead. For it is great and it is significant and it is mighty in His plan that all would hear the good news. I'm also wise enough to know that there will be great opposition. And if we are going to avoid that and dismantle that, it requires us to be yielded and listening and asking Him and seeking Him. His scripture, which is truth, says, Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. And if you'll dare this morning, I really believe God is going to remove and give you a fresh revelation of those walls of restriction 
that have been operating in so many different arenas. They've been operating here in the Redlands. They've been operating in, uh, in, in this nation. They've been operating around the world. They've been operating in our personal lives and situations. And there's been an element of preservation of the Lord. It's not all been bad. But there's also been an element of delay and opposition. And for those that dream, I, I just feel God say to you, get ready for wild dreams. For those that find him in nature, get ready to see some wild things that do not make sense in nature. It's going to reveal his glory and his splendor and his majesty. For those that find him through creative expression, painting, movement, the arts, songwriting, poetry, get ready because there's going to be an incredible overflow and expression in this move of God. Most importantly, I want to remind you that the battle is His. It's already been won. We need to change the narrative and partner with His words, His life, His hope. But we are entering into a new season, and I feel like He's calling us, if we will open our hearts, if we will trust Him, it's going to mean some good old days kind of stuff again. It's going to mean some totally brand new stuff again. It's going to mean some late night phone calls to disciple people. It's going to mean opening up your heart and your home and your life to receive His humanity in your world. It's going to look like humbling yourself every day and making sure that there is nothing that gets in the way of your God time every day. He's calling us into greater faith, greater expectancy. But we don't need to strive and struggle in it. We just need to rest and stop long enough to find where He is, find what He's saying, and run after it. Chase it, pursue it at all costs. He is the archer and he is wanting to, to draw back the bow and release you into all that he has. To send you into hard places. Some of you will actually land physically in land. He is going to shift you geographically and send you out. And you are going to go in and you are going to penetrate and you are going to pierce the land. And out of that land is going to flow His love and His grace and His mercy because you're there. For some of you, he is going, He's drawing back the bow and He's going to fling you into new areas of occupation. New jobs, new, new crazy just advancement in Korea because he's called you there and you're going to land in that community and you are going to penetrate the ground. Living water will spring forth from that place. For others of you, he is repositioning you. For others of you, he is strengthening the roots of your life. You won't go anywhere, but he'll use your faith filled declaration in the, the archer's bow and he's going to send that out. Just watch what he's going to do. But the time of old, disgusting microwave cardboard meals to use that imagery is done. That quick flash in the pan, rubbish, lack of nutrition, just Fill it up with the kettle and put the lid on for three minutes. Though it's done. There is a feast ahead. There is a table ahead. There is a bounty ahead. There is fragrance and vibrancy and color ahead. And for some of you, I feel like it's been gray. It's been like a Eeyore kind of a season. It's been gray and washed out. And this black and white hue has been over your life. And He wants to break that off you this morning if you'll let Him. 
vibrancy of colour. Mal and, and, and Chris, their, their, their flow of words this year has been about excellency and majesty and God's vibrancy and what He is doing in the world. And I believe we're going to start to see that even as we've transitioned into the springtime season where all the beautiful flowers come out and the dry grass and all that stuff is just, that season is done with. And I want you to to, to eagerly await new season. I want you to eagerly expect a bountiful table. Eagerly expect that which was hard in the former season is going to be easy in this season ahead. All because you're mindful of of these few things. The battle is His. Change the narrative, but be okay. He is an incredible shot. He doesn't miss. He penetrates where it needs to go. And He uses you and I don't know why He uses you and I, but He does to accomplish His purposes and His will and His plan. But the arrow doesn't fly itself, does it? It relies on the archer. It relies on the origin. It relies on who's shooting it. It relies on other forces that are around, air currents, movement. We've just got to make sure we're sharp. We've just got to make sure we're polished. We've just got to make sure that we're ready, that we're mended, that we're whole, that we're ready to go. But guys, it's kind of like, I'm done with the quick and easy. I'm done with the microwave stuff. I'm done with the blah. It, do you, does it make sense? We're going to places. There, there is a couple right now going into, I, about to go into a very, very difficult place. Persecution kind of a place. But God's sending them as an arrow for this season and this time, and it won't look the same. It'll be different. There'll be such freedom and liberty. New opposition, but freedom and liberty. New sound, new song. Amen. Does that make sense? Probably not, but that's okay. Good. Thank you, Chris. He is the way maker. He is a literal way maker. He is the path maker, the journey maker. The, he gives you that course of life. He clears it in the wilderness. He is the answer and he's the archer. The battle is his. Let's change the narrative. Are you excited? I don't know why I'm excited. I don't usually have much emotion in my life, as Michael would tell you. I'm an accountant, apparently an engineer, and we all know what they're like. But can I just encourage you, just allow the Lord, dream with Him again. Dream with Him again. Over the next few weeks, we'll dig into that a bit more and just see what their response was and what happened because they stopped. They just, they, they went on their face. They came together in unity. They, they submitted. They did that thing and God was faithful over Judah. Amen? Let's stand. We're going to go out singing something. Thank you, team.